Heavenly Father, I'm so thankful for the people who wrote those songs this morning because they speak straight into my heart and I think many of the hearts that are here this morning. We are so thankful to be here this morning. There is no other place that we would rather be than to be singing and praising and worshiping you because this is a foretaste of what heaven will be like And we cannot wait for that day to come. But we know that your work on earth is not yet done. You desire for us to bring the kingdom of God and to to hasten the kingdom of God into this uh, into this earth. And so, Lord, we want to set our minds now on your word, on your promises, on the beautiful face of your son, Jesus Christ, so that as we go forth from this world, we go out as salt and light, and we make this world a better place. We heal this land by the, by the words that come out of my, our mouth and by the actions of our hands and feet and by the thoughts of our minds, Lord. Let us be, Jesus, your hand and feet in this city. Oh, how hurting this city is. How much pain and how much depression and darkness in, is in this land. But yet there is a remnant. And we are that remnant. We are that remnant who has not yet bowed his knee to the gods of this world and therefore you will use us to bring light into darkness. Oh, we wait for that day, Lord, when many people who have turned from you in this country and in this city would once again turn to you so that you would heal them. We long for that day and we we sense, Lord, that it is not far away as long as your church is meek and is hungry and thirsty for righteousness, we will be satisfied. We pray this in your son's precious name. Amen. I don't know if it's because I've been fasting or because many people have been fasting in this church, but I feel that some very interesting things have been going on in this church. Um, My own prayer and my own scripture reading has been very affected by the way, um, by things that have been going on in our church. Yesterday night, um, as I came home, my my little daughter, she doesn't like sleeping early, so she was still awake at around 10 p.m., and my wife was too tired to take care of her, so she said, you take care of the baby, I'll take a shower. And I took Stephanie and said, oh, why, why don't we read the Bible? And I was walking to the sofa, and I opened her little children's five-minute Bible story um, book, and and I, and I just opened it, and, oh, okay, so let's read about... Jesus dying for us. And even as I was reading these children's words, I couldn't finish the story. It was too moving. And I, (laughs) and I was reading this story to Stephanie and she, she heard me read a few sentences and she heard me stop and she would look up at me because I was just crying and I was so moved by, by the words that were in those, (laughs) in that book. And then I just said, look, you see that this is the Jesus who died for you. And I don't know if she understood, but she kind of said, hmm. And then I said, (laughs) and then I said, do you want to accept Jesus into your heart? And she said, hmm. And then I prayed. And we taught her to put her hands together to pray. And then she prayed. And I just wept and wept yesterday because I feel like any time that we are talking about Jesus, um, anytime we are talking about salvation, anytime we're talking about God, we are on the brink of eternity. The theologian, this theolo- Puritan theologian called Thomas Goodwin, he said, when Jesus became man, heaven kissed earth. So every time I talk about Jesus, it's, it's like heaven is being brought right before our eyes. And I don't know what Stephanie was responding yesterday, but if she, in her little heart, prayed to receive Jesus with me yesterday, then then she is now part of that eternity. Isn't that what you want? To be, be part of eternity. And this is a very important thing for us, especially now, um, because as a pastor, one of my main jobs is not so much to teach. That's That's important. It's not so much to preach. That's very, very important. But in our day and age when you can have a cell phone and you can go on YouTube and look at, you can find preachers and teachers that are a hundred times better than me, more gifted, more talented, more knowledgeable than me. My role as a pastor is not mainly to teach the scriptures to you. 
It's to know the condition of my flock. That's my, my job. Proverbs 27, 23 says, know the condition of your flock and know the situation of your herd. That's my job. And speaking to you in your small groups and getting to know you more and more as I pastor here, I'm getting to know more of the condition of your souls and where they are. And one of the things that has come to my mind recently, very clearly in your sharings and small groups, is that so often what is hindering us from, from loving Jesus more is, is not sin or, or temptations primarily, but it's what the Hebrew author here calls a weariness. Right? I don't know if you sense this. Maybe, maybe this is not for every one of you, but I know it's, it is for some of you. There's a weariness. It's, um, you've been in church for 20 years and you've heard the gospel and, and you look at the cross, but, and you want to, to, to feel the way that I felt yesterday, but you, you don't know what's going on. You don't feel anything really. And there's a weariness about you and, and you want to do a lot of work for God and you want to serve His kingdom, but, but you're, you're physically and spiritually and emotionally tired. I think this is especially true for people who have been churches for a long time. So what, what needs to happen? What needs to happen? That's, that's where, where I come in. If I've, we've diagnosed a situation as a church that is feeling weary, then we need to find out what the solution and the remedy is. And so I'm inviting you now to turn to that remedy in Hebrews 12, verse 3. Hebrews 12, just verse 3. If someone around you can't find the verse, just help them out. Um, Hebrews 12, verse 3. Okay, I'm just going to read it one time. The author says, Consider Jesus. Consider Jesus, who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. The author here is saying, if you are weary, or if you're faint-hearted, faint-hearted means that you're, 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 you're desperate, you're giving up hope, you're losing courage, you're losing endurance. If, if that is you today, then the remedy for that is right there. Consider Jesus. Think about Jesus. Meditate on Jesus. Seek His face. That's the remedy. And the, 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 secret, the secret to running the Christian race well is determined by how well and how clearly you consider Jesus, how clearly you see him. I love what this pastor says. He says, the extent of your love for God is determined by the extent to which you understand Jesus is suffering for you. I'm going to say that again. The extent to which you can love God is determined by the extent to which you understand His suffering for you, not the suffering to the world. You see, Jesus died for the sins of this world, but that, that doesn't mean anything to you until Jesus died for your sins. See, I was baptized at 17, but I spent six years of those, those, that, those years wasting away my life because he had died for the sins of the world, but not died for my sins. And I often wonder, Jesus, what, what did I ever do to deserve your death? I don't, I never, I never did anything that bad. Why did you have to come and die? Why couldn't you just forgive? That was my first question that I had to answer when I was in seminary. But then when I was 23 years old, there was one night I heard a pastor preach on why Jesus had to die. And it primarily wasn't just for my sake, but it was to satisfy the justice of God. I remember just weeping that night because for the first time in my life, I understood that Jesus died for my sin. Have you, have you come to that point? Because if Jesus has not died for you yet, then you cannot be enduring. And you will be faint-hearted. And you will not be able to worship in full authenticity. 
the extent to which you know the suffering of Christ for you will determine your love for him. This is absolutely crucial. But before we look at this, I want, I want us to really focus on who God is first. When it says consider Jesus, Jesus is God and we need to consider who God is first. You see, God, so often we forget that God is the God of holiness. And He's the God of justice. And He's the God of righteousness. I've been reminded of this very recently in these last two months. That God is a God whom we need to be fearing and trembling before. Because His wrath, when it pours out, is something that we cannot even begin to imagine. You see... It's easy for seminary students in, in seminary to talk about, to talk about hell and talk about that in a very just abstract, objective way, a very mechanical way. But if hell really exists, then we need to be very careful how we think about hell and how we think about people going to hell. Right? Because we're talking about human beings here, souls, who will be eternally damned in hell. And when Jesus says that those who are wicked in this world will not inherit the kingdom, they will not enter the kingdom, that means that there will be many people who will be there. And the more I think about that, the more it causes me to be trembling before God and to say, Jesus, don't let me waste my time. Because there are my friends and there are families and there are my relatives who are probably going there and I need to do whatever I can to prevent that from happening. But I'm going to tell you a few things that God did in the Old Testament to show you His character. You see, the first worship service that the Israelites ever had was when Moses had, according to the descriptions that God gave him, he built the tabernacle to the dimensions that God had commanded. And then he gave Aaron and his sons the authority to come and give a sacrifice to God. Some of you may know this story. And as Aaron and his sons offered sacrifice, they rejoiced at first because the Spirit of God had returned to the tabernacle, to the Holy of Holies. But then it says that the sons of, of Aaron, they came up to the tabernacle and they offered strange fire. We don't know what they offered. They offered incense to God and it was in such a way that it was displeasing God. And immediately... God struck them down at the first worship service of the Israelites and these two priests of God, they fell over and they died. And God, pro pro he, he inhibited, he, he, he prohibited Moses and Aaron and all the people from mourning after the death of those two priests. And that's the God who we worship. He seeks after people who seek after his holiness but that holiness is determined by his standard. Several hundred years later, when King Hezekiah was ruling as a king, there was a moment in history when Sennacherib and his 185,000 soldiers were encamped against all of Israel. And Hezekiah cried out to God saying, Deliver us from this enemy. And it's, the scripture writes that God sent one angel, a single angel to come down. And in the night, God struck down all 185,000 soldiers of Sennacherib. And when Sennacherib and when Israel awoke, all they saw was a sea of dead bodies. One angel. And Sennacherib, he retreated from that. And when Sennacherib left to go and worship his own god, the god Naosh, his own sons came and assassinated him. That was the end of one of the greatest kings in all of history at that time, King Sennacherib. But we fast forward a little bit, and we come now to the time when Israel was worshiping God. They thought that they had been worshiping God in the image that they had created. Moses had been on Mount Sinai for 40 days and 40 nights waiting for the word of God to come to him so that he can transcribe it 
and he could bring it to the people. And as Moses, after 40 days and 40 nights on the Mount Sinai, he came down, he saw the people. The scripture says they were fooling around or they were playing around the golden calf that they had built. And they had been building this golden calf with the authority and with the with the permission of the priest Aaron. They were in the middle of this worship service and they were thinking that they were doing things that were pleasing God. And then when Moses came and he saw them, he threw the tablets down because God said, I will strike down these people. I will destroy them from the face of the earth. And, and Moses, the scripture says, he laid for 40 days and 40 nights again pleading with God not to be so angry against his people. And then Moses, he went into the camp and he went and he said, I call on all who have still have a heart and a devotion to God. And there were several hundred Levites who came. And Moses said to them, I want you to strap a sword to your side and go to and fro from the camp of Israel and cut down your brothers and your sisters. And so the Levites took their swords and they went and they murdered and they judged, they, they cut down their own brothers and their own sisters. This is the kind of God that we worship. The God that calls on people to tremble before Him. The reason I'm, I'm, I'm laying the foundations of this morning's service by beginning by showing you this is because only when you understand who God is and the holiness that He demands can you begin to appreciate His Son, Jesus Christ. John chapter 1 says, The Word, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh. And when Jesus walked on this earth, you have to imagine and you have to understand that it's the same God that I just described. The same God that called on the Levites to cut down their brothers. And the same God who sent one angel and destroyed 185,000 of his enemies. And the same God who cut down Aaron's two eldest sons, the same God who became flesh and dwelt among men. It's the same God. And if you were to imagine for a second, when the angels were in heaven and they heard that Jesus was going to become flesh and go into the midst of these people who were wicked and who would not accept Him. Can you imagine what these angels were thinking? They must have just been so blown away to think that their king, their commander, who they love, is going to go to the earth and become a man. That's why 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12 says, Salvation and the things that Jesus did are things that even the angels long to look into. Why do the angels want to look into this? Because they do not understand. They can't understand why Jesus would become a man to go and live amongst these people. They can't imagine why they would do that, why he would do that. And yet scripture says Jesus became flesh. The word became flesh and he dwelt among men. So here Hebrews 12 verse 3 says, Consider this Jesus, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself. And today I'm just going to point to four hostilities throughout Jesus' life that he endured. And I pray that God would do the same thing he did to me yesterday night, that as we just look at these things, we would just weep for joy and weep for sorrow that our king and our commander suffered such things. You see, at the very beginning of Jesus' birth, hostility was there. King Herod at that time wanted to kill all the firstborns of Jerusalem because he was afraid and he heard of the prophecy that there would be a king that would come and replace him. And so he issued that command to destroy all the firstborns. 
But this isn't the true hostility that Jesus endured. In Luke chapter 1, we read that when Jesus was born and when Mary gave birth to him, it says that she wrapped him in a swaddling cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for him in the inn. Our King, our God, the Creator of the universe, when He came into the earth and He came on earth, there was no reception for Him. There was no party welcoming in the King of glory whose words uphold the universe. When He came, there was no room for Him in the inn that He was born in. And He was laid in a manger where animals eat and drink. That's the kind of hostility that Jesus suffered and endured. It's very misleading during Christmas time when we look at the Christmas cards with the beautiful painting or pictures of the manger or of the, the, of the, of the stable in which Jesus was in. Because when we look at those pictures, we think, oh, how peaceful and how beautiful it must have been with all these animals and cows. If you've ever worked on a farm, you know that stables are not a place for humans to be in. Think of the flies that were going around because of the manure. Think of the, the stench of the animals. Think of the noise. And our King and our God, the sustainer of the universe, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was placed in a manger that's the kind of hostility Jesus had. That's the kind of welcome he had. And in John chapter 1 it says, He came to his own people, and yet his own did not receive him. There was no place for him in the inn, but there was also no place for him in the hearts of his own people. The very people that he had formed with dust and that he had breathed his spirit into, you see, we often forget this, that the Jesus that was incarnated in John chapter 1 verse 14 is the same God that created every single human being and who breathed his breath into them. That's the God who created them. And yet when he came to this earth and he, re he came to his own people, the people had no room for him, for him in his heart, in their hearts. Is there room for Jesus in your heart this morning? Is there room for them, for him? As Jesus grew up and he became a man who was wise and who grew in the favor and in stature before God and man, and as he began his ministry, things only got worse. If you read the Gospels, you will see that Jesus' ministry, from the first day it began, it was met with huge opposition from the religious leaders of his time. The chief priests, the Pharisees and the scribes of Jerusalem, they were the servants of God, remember? They were servants of Jesus. They were the ones who were supposed to teach the people about Messiah, about Jesus. They were the ones whose hearts and whose minds were overflowing with Old Testament scriptures. In fact, every single high priest and priest and chief priest they were supposed to memorize all of the first five books of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. They had to have those books in memory. These were the servants of God who were praying to Jesus, or so they thought. They were supposed to be praying to Jesus every single day. Every single day they were offering sacrifices to God. And yet when God came, the scripture says they sought to destroy him. Because they were jealous of him. And Jesus, Jesus, what should he have done? What should he have done? If you, being the, the boss or the, the, the master of your servants, you come into your company or you come into your kingdom and you command these people to do certain things and they not only disobey you, but they seek to destroy you, well, the first thing that you would do is you would call on other people to come and get rid of these servants. You see, Jesus, the thing he should have done was call on the angel that destroyed the 185,000 enemies of Sennacherib to come and destroy immediately these servants. 
And yet the scripture says here, he endured from these sinners such hostility against himself. He didn't say anything. He didn't destroy them. He didn't seek after revenge against them. And what he did more than anything in all of the Gospels is he sought to bring them back to God. You see, most of the sermons that Jesus preached were for these enemies of him, were for the high priests, were for the chief priests, were for the Pharisees. Many, many of the parables were told specifically to the Pharisees, not just to rebuke them, but to seek to bring them back what ought to be going through your mind now, and I'm so grateful for one of the sisters on the worship team yesterday, well, Priscilla, she said, when we read the scriptures, what goes through our mind, the first thing that should come is, this does not make any sense at all. It does not make sense at all that Jesus would do this. So Jesus suffered hostility right from the birth. And then during his ministry, he suffered hostility from his own servants. But even worse, Jesus suffered hostility from his own family. In John chapter 7, we read that Jesus' little brothers and his sisters, when he was going to tab the feast of the booths, the festival of the booths, his own disciples, his own brothers said to him, Jesus, why don't you bring your miracles to Jerusalem where everyone can see? Why don't you perform your miracles in front of everyone? And it says in John chapter 7, it says, because even his own brothers did not believe in him. This is the kind of Jesus that we worship, whose own family did not believe in him. You want to talk about loneliness? When I was growing up, I had the privilege of coming home every day and being able to pour out my heart to my family and my brothers. Who could Jesus pour out his heart to? when his own brothers did not believe in him. Another time, Jesus was so busy with his ministry that he didn't even have time to eat. And so his mother and his sisters and his brothers sent to Jesus and wanted him to eat something because he, they thought he had gone mad. And Jesus said, Who is my mother? Who is my brother? He who does the will of God. You see, Jesus had food to eat that they did not know anything about. And yet his own mother at times and his own family did not understand what he was doing. I know a lot of young people in this church, you, you feel that your parents don't understand you and you feel that your parents don't understand the struggles that you go through as a teenager. And that's true. They don't understand. But Jesus understands. Or even his own brothers and his own mothers did not at time believe in him. But it doesn't stop there. Because the, perhaps the greatest hostility that he suffered at the hand of sinners were not, was not the hostility from his birth, was not the hostility from his servants, the chief priests, was not this hostility that he felt from even his own family. But it was the hostility that he felt and that he experienced from his own disciples. Jesus had called 12 disciples to him. And you know that at the moment that Jesus was asking his own disciples to pray for him, he said to J James and John and Peter, he said, pray for me and stay awake with me, for my heart is sorrowful and troubled. Pray for me. Pray with me. And his own disciples would fall asleep and Jesus would have to be the only one keeping watch and prayer. And then we know this story. That when Jesus himself, he declared to his disciples that in very short time he would be destroyed and killed by the leaders of the synagogues and that he, on the third day he would rise again. Peter, oh humble, oh, oh bold and haste, hasty Peter, he spoke to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I will go with you even to death or even to prison. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth before the, cro the, before the rooster crows, you will have denied me three times. Even his own beloved disciple 
Peter, one of the three of his inner circle, would be the one who would betray him. But the hardest blow in Jesus' life, the hardest suffering that he must have endured, must have come from Judas, his disciple. Jesus had led him for three and a half years. Jesus had taught him. Jesus had shown him miracles. Judas had seen the feeding of the 5,000, the feeding of the 4,000. He had seen Jesus walk on water. He had seen Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. He had seen all of these things. And then at the very end, Judas, he devised perhaps the most outrageous and the most painful way to betray his master. He sold his own master for 30 coins of silver. Jesus Christ, the creator of the universe, wasn't even worth more than $30 to his own disciple. That's the kind of hostility that Jesus suffered at the hands of these sinners. Jesus is looking at Judas someone that he created with his own hands, someone that he raised up to be a man right there in front of him, someone who he poured out his spirit on, whom he spoke the words of God to directly. And every single day they lived and they ate and they spent time together. And when he saw Judas come up to him and give him this kiss, you see, it says in John that Jesus just said, friend, do what you came to do. Jesus didn't get angry at him. Jesus didn't rebuke him. Jesus just said, friend, just do what you came to do. You know, in all of history, in all of history, the most outrageous thing that happened was the betrayal and the murder of Jesus Christ at the hands of his own people. You see, so grateful for Reverend Stephen Tong because he spoke about a very interesting way of seeing this moment in history. Imagine for a second what the angels must have been thinking. The servants of God who loved Jesus with all their heart, who were worshiping Him every single day, singing, Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, singing that all day and all night, hundreds of thousands and thousands of angels, when they saw Judas come and kiss Jesus in the kiss of betrayal, and then when they saw these Roman soldiers encouraged by the chief priests to nail the, Jesus on the cross, think about the tears and the weeping that must have been going out on in heaven. It must have been the most, the most dark day in all of heaven. And we know this because when Jesus died, it says that there was a huge and great darkness that came upon the land. I believe that that darkness was reflected first in heaven. All of these servants must have been at the ready, saying to Jesus, the archangel Michael, the archangel, the angel Gabriel, they must have been there saying, Jesus, just say the word and I'm going to come down and we will cut down these sinners. Just say the word. They must have had their sword at the ready. They must have been ready to come down and just strike all of these people down. You see, it took one angel to cut down 185,000 in Sennacherib's army. Half an angel could have come and destroyed the tens of thousands that were perhaps there at Golgotha. But Jesus was silent. The scripture says he was Silent like a lamb that was led to the slaughter. This is the Jesus who we worship. And at the very moment that Jesus finally opened his mouth, when he finally opened his mouth at the cross, the words that came, the first words that came were, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Think of the weeping that must have gone on in heaven. They must have been screaming on the tops of their lungs, these angels, saying, Why? Why would you do this? Why would you forgive them? Why would you even begin to have mercy on these people? 
Even angels don't have mercy when they sin. Why do these despicable sinners have your forgiveness? They must have been weeping for that. And Jesus just said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. This is the kind of hostility that Jesus endured. And the important thing that we need to see here is He did it for you. Because though we may not have been there 200 years, 2,000 years ago at the nailing and the murder of the Son of God, we don't need to go very far to realize that when Jesus came into our lives, we did not make room for Him. Was there room for Him in our heart? Quite often, there was no room for Him in our life. When Jesus came and we call ourselves the servants of God and Christians and He came and He comes into this church and He looks at the things that we do and He looks at the way that we live our lives and we who have received the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations, if we're really honest with ourselves, Jesus would come and, and, and what would He say to us? We who are His servants, we who are His children, what would He say to you this morning? And we who are called Jesus' son, uh, we who are called Jesus' brothers and His sisters, do we, just like His own blood relatives, do we also disbelieve in Him? Do we also think that His call and His ministry was mad and the thing that He called things that He de demands of us are just too crazy for us to do. Do we also think that? And I don't think we need to go very far because I think most of us would say that we are just like His brothers. We are just like His chief priests. And we are just like the world who had no room for Him. But I think even more than that, I think Jesus knows and we know that in many ways in our life we have sold Jesus off. Perhaps not even for 30 coins of silver. Because Jesus comes and He gives us our life and He says that you have been bought with the precious blood of the Lamb. And yet in the way that we live, we often, we don't struggle against sin, as it says here in verse 4, instead we, we accept sin. And we sell Jesus off and we despise His death and His resurrection. Instead of struggling against sin, we live in sin. And so Jesus looks at us, and He looks at us, and we are just like His disciple Peter. We may not deny Him with our mouth, but we deny Him in our actions. We may not be like Judas who sold Jesus off and betrayed Him, but we betray Him in our actions and in the way we live our lives. And yet at the height of this most outrageous sin, where the angels are crying out, send us down right now, Jesus, so we can cut down these sinners. Jesus says the same words He said at the cross to us. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the Jesus we worship. That when He looks down from heaven on us, he sees these sins. He sees this evil. He sees your life. He sees your betrayal. He sees your lack of room for Him. And He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Oh, how beautiful our Jesus is. There is none like Him. And I would spend eternity trying to preach and trying to get out all the amazing things from what happened at that cross and at that moment. But let me just come back to here in verse 3 of chapter 12. It says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Are you weary this morning? Are you faint-hearted this morning? Well, take a good look at Jesus' suffering for you and your heart will be strengthened. Take a really long look. You fast from food if you need to. 
Fast from the internet if you need to. Fast from entertainment if you need to. Do whatever it will take for you to look at Him and pray until the moment your eyes begin to see Him. And when you begin to see Him, there will be what is called in First Peter an inexpressible joy that will come inside of you. And you will not even be able to explain it to people what is going on in your life. I'm so thankful and I'm praying that God will sustain me in that place where every time I look through His Word, I am brought to that place of just total mesmerization of Jesus' beauty. And I pray that for you. And I'm praying especially that for you today. Because we're coming to His table now to partake of His blood and His body. And this can be just like another routine in any other religion where you just perform another ritual. But if you're praying now and saying, God, help me see the beauty of your Son through these elements. Help me see it. Then when you eat and you drink, you will be strengthened. You will be encouraged. And you will not grow weary or faint-hearted regardless of the things in your life. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what we're praying for? I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. They're going to lead a song. Before we do that, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, You know the hearts of Your people. You know where we are in our walk with You. You know perhaps many of us this morning are weary and faint-hearted and discouraged. Lord, I'm asking that you would once again open the eyes of our hearts so that we would see your son, see the hostilities that he suffered in himself for our sake, and that we would be strengthened, there would be this joy inexpressible in us. Oh, Father, we ask this in your son's most precious name. Amen.